Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2019. I can ask that all mobile devices are switched to silent. I welcome Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, and John Finney, MSP, joining the committee this afternoon. We have apologies from Oliver Mandel, MSP, and Annie Wells, MSP. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the tragic events in Christchurch, New Zealand, earlier today. The committee is joined this afternoon by a number of faith and belief groups. Um, I'm sure we'd want to come together to condemn this cowardly attack motivated by hate for a particular faith and send our thoughts, love and prayers to all those affected. Agenda item one is the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Um, this is the third evidence session on children equal protection from assault. Can I welcome James Gillis, Public Policy Assistant, the Christian Institute, Reverend Gordon Matheson, Minister, Evangelical Alliance, and Re Reverend Richard Ross, Minister, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. Um, can I open things by asking um, each of you whether you support the aims of the bill, which is to end the physical punishment of children? If you wish to start, James. Oh, yeah. The Christian Institute is opposed to the bill. Okay. And the Free Church of Scotland continuing is opposed to the bill. Um, the Evangelical Alliance Scotland is also opposed to the bill. I could add as well just a note of thanks to the committee. I'm stepping in at very short notice. Kieran Turner, our um, public policy officer, was supposed to be sitting in this chair today and was unable to attend, so I've come at fairly short notice. Okay. But I'll endeavour to, to answer as I can. Well, thank you for joining us. You're, you're very welcome. Um, I'm going to open out to committee members now. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton, do you want to kick things off? Well, good afternoon to the panel. Thank you very much for coming to see us today. Um, I hope very much to hear your uh, testimony, and it will really inform our consideration of the bill, so I'm grateful to you for that. Um, I'd like to start by looking at something we've covered in the previous uh, committee sessions. It's, it's okay if you've not managed to see those, um, but it's about this uh, the perception of attention that exists between children's rights and parents' rights. Um, we know um, through um, a lot of evidence we've received, um, not just for this bill, but through other bills that we've taken through Parliament, um, about the international imperative of organisations like the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child that say that we are not meeting our obligations to the UNCRC um, in, in as much as we still allow physical punishment of children in the home. And there are specific articles to which we are signatories which are incompatible with the continuation of physical punishment in the home. It's not li just limited to the UNCRC. There are other conventions we are signatories which are also incompatible to physical punishment in the home. Um, are we, is that tension real? And where in other international laws or treaties to which we are signatory does that jar and what are those rights that are given to parents which should allow them to continue to physically punish their children? Okay. Who wishes to, to start? Shall I begin? Of course, yeah. Um, yeah, I think what was touched on before is that uh, the fact that children and parents and adults have different uh, legal standing in law uh, in an existing sense. Parents have uh, authority over, over their own children and the rights uh, in law uh, are slightly different because of that. Um, it's often said that the obligation under the UN uh, Children's Rights uh, Declaration is to ban smacking. Um, but uh, in the declaration itself, it's, it states that children should be protected from violence. Uh, and we agree absolutely with this. But we'd say that uh, the Christians would say that uh, the current law already does protect children from violence. Um, smacking, uh, as used by many thousands of loving parents across Scotland, Christians and others, uh, is not violence against a child. It's not abusive. Uh, and so the obligation is, has already been met under existing Scots law, uh, and this legislation is not necessary to uh, add further protection to children. And uh, in fact, uh, we'd say it wouldn't enhance protections of children. It would actually distract uh, the police and social workers and others from doing the very important work of already identifying abuse, abuse under the law. Before I bring in, Chair, the other uh, panel members, um, can I just state for the record, I think it's important to be absolutely clear that this, uh, this bill doesn't create a new offence in terms of banning smacking. Smacking was always an assault, um, but there was a legal defence which parents could lean into uh, to justify their actions. Um, we're only talking about removing that and equalising the protections in the eyes of the law that children and adults have. Can I extend my original question, Chair, to... Uh, Reverend Ross and Reverend Matheson. Uh, maybe I could uh, bring in the, the scriptural 
uh, support. Uh, we as a church believe that uh, the scriptures are the word of God and they are the rule of life as well as uh, the rule for the church. And there are many scriptures that speak of a, a child's responsibility, honor thy father and mother. That is a responsibility there laid upon children. And uh, there is the parental responsibility not to provoke their children to wrath. So if you take the scriptural authority, you have their protection for both the child and the parents because God's standard is laid down. If you turn away from God's standard and replace it with a standard that is uh, limited to mortal man, then you're going to have nothing but trouble. Before I bring in Reverend Matheson, can I just ask Reverend Ross, do you believe that we should use scripture to define all sort of human law, that uh, human law should follow the word of God as it applies throughout the Bible? Every, every aspect of the Bible should actually be the law that we govern our country with. Scot uh, Scottish law, as I understand it, is based upon uh, the moral law as we have it in the, in the word of God. And this is going to move away from that and it's going to open up uh, the Scots law to be defined by man himself. So the authority is only going to be man rather than a God-given authority. And where you have that God-given authority, you have real authority. But particularly when it comes to Scripture, Reverend Ross, you, you do accept that there are aspects of Scripture which we have laid by, laid aside and recognized that they, they don't fit our modern world, that um, you know, certain, well, particularly well, within the Old well, Testament, that th they are not necessarily the way that we would recognize a, a, a good way to live and conduct our, our lives. Perhaps the political elite have, but I'm talking about uh, the ordinary day-to-day law-abiding citizens. Uh, many, many in Scotland, many thousands of Scots, perhaps millions of Scots, believe that the Scriptures give a good, solid foundation for life, not only for children, but for parents. And if I, as, as we understand it, this is an open attack on the authority of God to tell us how to live, and because this is, a, this is an open attack, then it is smashing the very foundation of Scottish society. Can, can I just ask, uh, I mean, we will come on more on to Scripture, but um, when you say this is an open attack on the authority of God, where in the Bible does God tell us to physically punish our children? It, it, it says in, in Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. It's, it, it there is saying that God lovingly chastens his people. I would chasten, if I may chair, my children every day. I don't do it physically. I do it with screen bands and uh, timeouts. I, I, surely God can find other ways to chasten his flock. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not here uh, to defend God. God has given us his word, and we either accept it or we don't. And you could say there are, are, there are other ways. But what has the other ways produced so far? Look, uh, look around the world. Look, uh, look at the questions that were asked from the floor that, that uh, didn't receive proper answers from the panel re regarding the state of the world. Man doesn't have the answers for these things. Men don't have the answers for the state of the world. Look, look at our nation at the moment. It's an quagmire. It's because we've turned our back on the Lord. We've turned our back on his word. And this, this, this legislation, although you're saying you're not creating a new offense, you are. You are creating a new offense. You're going to uh, find loving Christian parents who use uh, smacking or other forms of parental discipline are going to have that taken away. Now, the scriptures teach that parents have that right. They have that right. And it's a, it's a, it's a I know it's something that uh, people don't accept, but that is what the scriptures teach. So if we're going to uh, take away the foundation of God's law from the nation, we are in serious trouble. I was raised in a non-physical punishing home and... and I'm, I think I turned out okay. Can I ask um, Reverend Matheson your position on, on this conflict between the, the rights? I've spent the last 
48 hours, kind of trying to catch up with um, some of the committee's previous evidence sessions as well, and and reading kind of around around the subject. And I genuinely feel probably unqualified to answer the very specific question about compliance with international treaties. However, what I would say is looking at the some of the evidence sessions, I understand, uh, and it was mentioned earlier in the in the session this morning, this afternoon, around about 50 countries around the world have already adopted using various instruments, um, the provisions that are requested in these treaties. I, I think what's really interesting is that for us in Scotland, the, the, the chosen method that we've ended up going for um, is to amend criminal law rather than to take a civil law approach to it. And I, I think one of, one, of my, one of my concerns is that, that I'm not sure how thoroughly we have scrutinised it. Um, you know, the, the, the talk about the New Zealand example, I hadn't actually noticed that until, until we were again this afternoon, but you know, even the fact that there have been eight um, prosecutions arising since New Zealand changed their, their, their criminal law in this regard. My... Just to interrupt you briefly, this is the scrutiny. This is the, we're, we're in the process of scrutinising yeah. it, so we are taking it very seriously. Yeah. And, well, yeah. I, I think my, 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 my... Well, I suppose to make my point then um, would be that perhaps, if, you know, Evangelical Alliance, as we, as we have in a written submission, we would respectfully suggest perhaps that the committee should provide a heightened scrutiny of the, the proportionality of this particular method of achieving the stated goals that you have, um, rather than using a, a civil, uh, rather than using, sorry, a criminal um, instrument, that perhaps it might be worth looking at um, if there may be civil instruments that could be used instead. If I may, convener, and then I'll hand over to other members, of course. Um, the reason we're adopting this approach because it is a road well travelled. This legal defence used to apply to the punishment of a wife by her husband, and thankfully that was repealed and, and doesn't exist anymore. Now, there are aspects of scripture which you could interpret to suggest that men should have the right to physically punish their wives. Happily, we live in a society which utterly rejects that notion. I believe that progress dictates that this is a necessary part in the human journey in this country. Convener. Can I just... Okay. Yes, but one at a time. So, <laughs> ask uh, Mr. Alec Cole Hamilton if he could show me. He, he just said scripture supports uh, husbands beating wives. Can no, you I show said me? I, you could interpret. Can, can you show me? You could interpret. Can if, you show me? If, if no. there's a there's Folks. an open Bible here. <laughs> Okay. Well, he's he's claiming to know what scripture okay. teaches, okay. but he can't. You're putting can't, words in my mouth. No, he can't prove else. what he's just said. No, convener. No, no. And I would no, also I'll like to ask, who is actually the convener of this committee? Because it looks like Mr. Cole Hamilton's taking a chair. Well. Okay, a rousing There's an open Bible here. After the session, Reverend, you show me that, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I, th I think it'll be good for all of us if we I conduct this here. meeting in a, in a proper and, and mannerly and respectful way. I am We're not being aggressive. Well, you're interrupt I'm not saying you're being aggressive. And I'm not saying you're being disrespectful. I'm just reminding you that there's a meeting of the Scottish Parliament... We've invited you here to hear your views. I want mm -hmm. you to have the chance to give them a full airing and for us to be able to question you on that. So we'll just conduct ourselves properly. James Gillis, you wanted to come in on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, the Reverend's probably trying to communicate that the vast majority of Christians would not state that uh, Scripture condones uh, violence in the home. Um, but just to come back to the, the actual defence and law, the Section 51 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act, um, so our understanding is that it expressly outlaws the use of an implement, uh, blows to the head and shaking, which you stated already. Um, but there's also explanatory notes to the defence, uh, which state that ch chastisement should be moderate and not insp uh, inspired by vindictiveness. So really what it's talking about is the only the most mild uh, tap on the hand or smack on the bottom. It's a defence in law which really clarifies the law and which is understood by prosecutors and by the police. And it makes a distinction between violence and smacking, which is used by loving parents and is very light and moderate. Uh, and some of the submissions to the recent consultation which you held um, from police officers themselves, child protection specialists, said that this, uh, this section of the law is actually useful to them. Uh, it gives them um, the ability to make a distinction between these things and make a judgment call uh, and say, actually, in one case, uh, this is just loving chastisement, and in other cases, this is abuse, and this should be pursued and brought uh, into a, made into a criminal uh, case. So police officers on the ground, including one submission uh, which we read uh, from an anonymous officer set with 29 years' experience in child protection work, he said that this is a very useful defence in the law. Uh, and the effect of removing this would be to make all physical discipline, no matter how mild, 
effectively uh, and technically an assault under law. Uh, and that would lead to parents being arrested and prosecuted and perhaps even convicted under the law because police would be compelled to investigate a report of smacking in the same way that they're currently compelled to investigate abuse. Um, so, sorry, just one, one final point is that in New Zealand, uh, before the law changed there, politicians did tr seek to uh, say that this law will not result in parents being criminalised. Um, but that's exactly what's happened. Uh, and a legal report released last year uh, said effectively that, that parents have been criminalised. So, with respect, your, your assertion that good parents won't be criminalised uh, and this won't happen, um, that's not the case abroad. And so, looking to examples abroad, uh, we'd argue that the same thing will happen here. Uh, and many of the parents out in the audience today are, are, are concerned about exactly that. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, Fulton, I think your question is linking quite well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener, um, and, and, and welcome, uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Gillis, just uh, the, the point you were you were making there. Do you know from any of the the research that, that your organisation has, if any, of how often the um, justifiable assault is used in a court or as a defence? Um, we, and I don't think uh, this committee, have, have come across uh, any instances where this defence has been used to actually allow unreasonable uh, physical violence to take place. Uh, in effect, the law is, uh, the defence is in invoked very rarely. Uh, and we'd say that shows that it's well understood. It's a long existing defence in law uh, and it's very clear. Uh, and so it's not cited uh, very often because the courts and the police know the difference between violence and between loving parental discipline, yeah. uh, and that's why it's not cited in court. So, so why do you think that that would change? I think you're right. I was um, uh, I declared for the interest of a child protection social worker for eight for eight years, um, and was involved in in a lot of joint investigative interviews. For example, how do you think that would change if this bill is passed? Because, as I've said in previous committee sessions, if a um, if an allegation is made, it's not for a teacher or a a health visitor or MDLs to judge whether it's a minor allegation or a smack or whatever, it goes through a process, a child protection process. How do you think if this um, bill is passed, that will change? Um, there is a submission to the consultation, which I'm uh, trying to track down here, uh, from an enormous of officer number uh, 349. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly why it's anonymised, but he has 29 years experience, mainly as a detective. Uh, he spent 10 years working in the Child Protection Department as a detective sergeant uh, and also in the National Child, Child Abuse Investigation Unit. So it's fair to say he's got a lot of experience. And he, he uh, explains the process as it is uh, and makes an example about a, a young boy who tells his teacher that his mother smacked him and what exactly would happen in practice. Uh, and he says that he's against the proposal because uh, it will... Um, the point I explained earlier about smacking being treated as abuse, he says, in effect, that every allegation of smacking would have to launch a criminal investigation and they would be compelled to investigate it in that way. Uh, and he says, my experience of working in child protection shows that despite a massive injection of staff over the years, the current workload of investigators is virtually unmanageable. Um, should this law be passed, the workloads of both the police and social work would be massively impacted, meaning those already thin, thinly spread groups uh, would have to do much more and in his opinion it's disproportionate and irresponsible to introduce legislation that is not deemed necessary or helpful by practitioners on the ground such as himself. So, so I appreciate that that, uh, that that was an individual's view but the, the vast majority of evidence that we've taken um, up to now and on behalf of agencies such as Police Scotland uh, and, and others have suggested that, that that wouldn't be the case and that the current procedures that are already in place uh, there's no, uh, they don't already think about, you know, uh, 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 as a parent going to use justifiable um, assault uh, as a defence before they decide whether whether to prosecute. And, and actually, the whole um, system around child protection, particularly, is to find balance and a measured approach to protecting children and also safeguarding families. So I, uh, we, we haven't heard a lot of evidence to suggest that would change. But I wonder whether you agree or not that actually, um, rather than worrying about um, a, an increase in the criminalisation of parents, that actually one of the, the major problems we have in Scotland uh, and probably across the world uh, right now is actually trying to, to get convictions for people who are committing really really serious offences against children. Um, and that, and do you not then agree that this law 
could help bring that more into the, the forefront of people's minds. Of course, uh, we'd agree that that is of fundamental importance, that, that people are, are abuse is identified and the perpetrators are brought to justice. Um, but we can only go by the evidence we've seen and which we included in our own submission uh, from people like this officer. Um, Police Scotland did talk about uh, uh, cost and resource implications of this law. Uh, we think the best way to strengthen the arm of the police and others would be to exist in the, uh, sorry, strengthen the existing structures that are in place. Uh, if people are complaining that they're overworked, that their workloads are unmanageable, we know social workers and others are already under huge stress. The way to help them uh, is to give them more resources uh, and help them to do their job under the existing law and uh, asking them to go after parents uh, who have said they smacked their children, who in the vast majority of cases are loving, ordinary, reasonable parents, uh, that will distract them and that will have an implication uh, and make them, their workload worse. Um, so uh, it, it is our fear that this legislation, aside from actually helping children, will uh, distract the police and distract social work uh, and could ultimately uh, thin, spread that net so thinly that some of these extreme cases of abuse are missed. Uh, and that's, that's a very sad prospect. But but do you accept the earlier point I made, and, and perhaps widen it out to the to the rest of the panel as well? Because I, I, I appreciate I've been focusing on yourself, Mr. Gilmour. I apologise for that. But do you accept that the ch for the instances you've described, the examples, the hypothetical examples, which which are real life examples, uh, uh, everyday examples, should I say? There's already child protection procedures in place, and they are already currently being used, and that that law that this bill does not alter that. Do you want to go? <laughs> Could I maybe say that, that at the moment I suspect the, the, that that's true at an investigative stage, but my concern would be at the, the next stage when it comes to mounting prosecutions. Um, I don't know if there has been enough investigation and accumulation of data to, to support the, the notion that uh, a change to uh, removing the, the reasonable chastisement defence would actually result in a, no net, well, a, a very low net increase in prosecutions. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm just not convinced that the you know that, that in the evidence you've received that that has been fully articulated and I would I would genuinely love to see that um, perhaps further investigated and, and for the committee's resources to be devoted um, mm -hmm. to looking into that in, in some detail yeah we are of the view that the Scottish Parliament ought to devote its efforts to tackling uh, real harm and abuse to children um, but this will be a net that will catch it will catch loving parents because it is going to be spread so wide. And it's, it's, it's an intrusion into family life that, uh, that, that, that doesn't belong to the state. Uh, children uh, are given to the parents to bring them up. It, it doesn't belong to the state to tell uh, parents at what level they are uh, to deal with their children. The, the parents are best suited to bring up their children. I mean, I am a father myself. Um, we know Mr. Hamilton is a father. Uh, he wouldn't, uh, I presume, I presume he wouldn't uh, like me to come and tell him how to bring his children up. So why should others have to be told uh, by a parliamentary committee or by the Scottish Parliament or by anyone else how to bring up their children? This, this, this is a this is our God-given right. Parents are best placed to decide, not somebody on the outside who's looking in, but, but parents themselves. I'm sure Mr. Hamilton would agree with me. He is best uh, placed to, to bring up his children in the way that he feels uh, suitable. So, so, so the, the only kind of thing I would say on that is that I, I hear what you're saying um, about, about parents knowing best, but it goes back to the earlier point. Do you not agree that it's already that so smacking, I think is as Alex Go Hamilton um, ben, is already an offence. What this bill is looking at is removing a justifiable not, so not it, but it is it's, it's, a, it's a process that would be uh, pros prosecutors, police and other partners in the criminal justice system would, would determine whether something's taken forward or not and it, it would be then for the, the justifiable defence to be used. And what we're not hearing from anybody involved in the uh, that's came to speak to us so far is how often this has been used. Doesn't, doesn't that apply, kind of looking at the question from both angles? I mean, th there's no clamour from Police Scotland or from the prosecution services to remove this. And 
if that was the case, then there would perhaps be more sympathy. But the fact is, you know, the, 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 the clamor for change for this is coming from within, you know, within, within a, a poli you know, political class rather than from those who are actually at the front end in dealing with prosecutions in this. And they're not finding that this is, an, this is a barrier, an obstacle to, to taking prosecutions forward. So if it's not providing a barrier at the moment, then surely that maybe argues against removing... I'm just going to let Alec Hamilton come in briefly. Thank you very much, Convener. I just wanted to, to address for the record, or, or put back to the panel, um, we've heard from James Gillis um, the testimony of an unnamed police officer about his concerns around the bill, and he's absolutely entitled to those views. Um, what do the panel believe or, or think about the interventions of Police Scotland and, more notably, um, Strathclyde Violence Reduction Unit, who are broadly supportive of the aims of the bill, not least because Strathclyde Violence Reduction Unit believe that far from taking up more police time in prosecuting parents, it will actually help their efforts to reduce violence on our streets by delegitimizing the use of violence as a tool of sanction or anger um, so I, I just challenge your use of the word violence there um, again it goes back to the distinction between violence between smacking which is loving discipline to thousands of parents um, and I suppose the central question behind this legislation is is smacking harmful to children? Uh, and we would state that the research evidence does not show that. Um, the policy memorandum for this bill uh, cites reports which seem to imply that uh, smacking is harmful, uh, has uh, effects on children. But uh, the Welsh government, um, which is also consulting on a similar change to the law just now, uh, stated in its consultation document that there is unlikely to be any research evidence which specifically shows the effect of a light and infrequent smack as being harmful to children. Uh, and there's also submissions to the recent consultation, again, by Professor Lars Aliers, uh, Ferguson and uh, Gunnell, uh, US psychology professors who have studied the major uh, research uh, on smacking, and they've looked at the methodology behind that. And they fear that it's uh, sort of confirmation bias there. So uh, the indication we, we've seen from the Welsh government uh, in its honest assessment ahead of its legislative change uh, and these other academics is that the research evidence does not anywhere near conclusively show that a light smack, uh, which many parents use uh, in loving homes, actually harms a child. But my point, sir, sorry, Chair, um, is that Strathclyde Violence Reduction Unit equate the fact that children who receive a physical intervention believe then that a physical intervention can be appropriate outside of the home amongst their peers. That is their point. Irrespective of whether you believe it harmful or violent, they believe the connection of a hand to a body part is a legitimate tool of anger or sanction. Do you accept that? Well, I'd ask to say, see the, the research evidence behind that. Uh, I don't think there's any research evidence uh, to show that uh, a, a logical connection between a, a light smack used by parents and violence. Uh, I don't think... Uh, there's a link between smacking and violence in children. If you look at Sweden, the example there, uh, what we've seen since the change in the law there in the 1970s is a huge rise, over a thousand percent rise uh, in child-on-child -child violence uh, after smacking has been banned. Uh, so it's the sort of opposite from what's being stated there. Uh, so, so rather than smacking uh, causing or begetting violence, um, it's actually reducing it. So some researchers would say that. So we, so we would question that, that assertion that there's a logical connection between smacking and violence. I agree with Mr. Uh, Mr. Gillis here. Smacking is not violence. Smacking is discipline. There is a difference between discipline and uh, violence. Uh, you yourself said in, in the public uh, question and answer session that you yourself were smart. Has it made you more violent? I was smacked once, and yeah. then I turned uh, around and bit my father in the face. So, yes, it did. Yeah, but you were two years time. old. Absolutely. He you never know. hit me again. Yeah, but uh, how many other members of the, the committee have been smacked? So, the committee are here to ask the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so, it, I think we'll bring in Mr. No, uh, but can I, can I just make the point, Convener? It, you know, I, I, would, I, pre I, would presume, I would presume that uh, most of the committee have been smacked, and uh, maybe uh, as parents, they have smacked their children. It hasn't held anybody in the committee back. You're all members of parliament. It hasn't psychologically damaged you. It hasn't made you violent. Okay, you you've made your point. 
Okay. Seriously, Reverend well, Matheson, you wanted to come. I up. think, I mean, in the context of in the context of um, of the violence reduction unit in Strathclyde, the, the it is interesting, you know, to see these assessments on the police's part against the the public perception of where this is going. Um, around about three quarters of of Scots requested, um, in, you know, polled on this, have have found, you know, that there's there's some um, there's some opposition, I suppose, to removing this defensive law. So. Given that there's, you know, 74% of people are against this, um, I, I do wonder, you know, where, you know, what the, what the actual goal of using a, a legislative change of this nature, which is a very blunt instrument, is going to have when, you know, the, you, you set that against the behavioural changes that we already see. And I think it's, it's quite welcome, in fact, to acknowledge that smacking on a, on a whole scale, um, you know, behavioural pattern in society has reduced. I think that's probably a good thing. Um, I think it's it's great that today we um, have access to a whole range of parenting tools. I mean, I think about my mum when I was growing up. Um, she, I think, didn't have much of a, a notion of putting me on the naughty step. Um, she didn't have much of a notion of the sort of steps that I take with my daughter um, and my son at home as well. And, and I, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, that, that we're already seeing behavioural changes that are making aggressive and abusive smacking a thing of the past. And if that is the case, then what we're going to be left with is proportionate, I think is reasonable. Um, and and the, the question I'm, I'm still coming back to is, is it reasonable for us therefore to, as a society, to prosecute a reasonable level of smacking in, um, in homes where it is perhaps one off, um, perhaps not done in anger, um, but done as a, as, a, as a loving and careful and considered response to a very pressing situation which needs reinforcement. And that's the experience I think of probably the 74% of Scots who've been pulled and find this change unnecessary. Okay, Gail Ross, you wanted to come in. Thank you, uh, convener, and thank you, panel. I just wanted um, to get your opinion. When a parent smacks a child, um, taking into account that it's proportionate and reasonable, what is the end result that the parent is expecting from the smack? Well, it, it entirely depends on the situation. I mean, if a child's going to run out on the road, the end result would be to stop them running out on the road. Or if they're going to pull a pan of hot water down on themselves, you're going to keep them from danger. So, but, so, so it's, it, it's, it's like asking how long's a piece of string. So you know, you know, you need to know the context before you can say, well, what, what, what's the, what, what is the end? result going to be. So so every instance of smacking is different for different circumstances and it can take a different level. Yet I think um, James Gill, as you said, that smacking is light and infrequent. Therefore, what is the point? Why do it at all? Well, I'd say that it's a it's one technique which parents use as part of that discipline imbuing a sense of right and wrong in children. Um, and from the anecdotal evidence we've heard, it is light and it's infrequent. Um, so there is the example that the Reverend's uh, used of a child being in immediate danger, but there's also the uh, just uh, use of smacking as a form of discipline, uh, a light, light smack or a tap on the hand. Um, and anecdotally, people would say some children don't respond to verbal warnings if they keep reaching out for a socket or something, um, and they get a light tap on the hand, that sort of communicates the message to them uh, at an age where verbal communication isn't so effective. It communicates in what way? Sorry, I don't understand. Well, is it to inflict fear or to inflict pain? What way does that communicate that to that child? I well, I suppose it's a very, very uh, light, um, slightly painful thing that communicates a sense of a danger or uh, that they're doing something wrong. OK. Um, but it's something that's very light and mild and reasonable. Uh, and parents would never be seeking to harm their children um, as they smack them. I think it's just part of loving parenting and, uh, you know, they want what's best for their children. Absolutely. Thank you. Maybe I could uh, come in as well. Uh, we've got to bear in mind the, the nature of a child. You know, uh, there, there are different opinions about the nature of a child. Some people think that children are innocent. Some, pe some people see that children need correction. Like the scriptures teach that, that we're all sinners. So we all need correction. And a gentle smack is part of the correction, as well as a, a, a verbal rebuke. It is part of the correction. It's part of the teaching process. It's, it's like if you go to school 
and uh, you get a question wrong. If you're never told that you're wrong, then you're never going to learn anything. But if you get a question wrong in school, you're told that you're wrong and explained why and told the right answer, you're yeah. not given a light tap to correct Well, well perhaps, perhaps when Thankfully. you were in school. No, I wasn't. <laughs> so how old do you think I am? <laughs> but, no, but, but the, the point is, how, how, do you, how are you going to know the difference between right and wrong? If you don't, if, if you don't have that opportunity to uh, give the child a smack, if they're running out on the road, say, if they're running off on you, they're running off on you. You need to. You need that instant. You need that instant. You can't grab them back and and start explaining to them, because they're off. You have you have to have uh, that uh, ability to communicate to the child that what they have done is wrong. Okay. Thank you. I think it's interesting to note that in these circumstances, well, very often it's an instinctive response. Um, parents in in these circumstances, I. I, I I mean, having been there myself, um, you, you find an element of alarm when your child runs off out onto the road or, I mean, where we stay, there's tractors up and down all the time and it's, you know, if the gates aren't locked, we're kind of thinking, ooh. Um, but, you know, it's the same with a hot pan on the stove um, or, or tampering with an oven while it's open or whatever else. Uh, the, the parental alarm says this is a really dangerous situation, which no amount of explanation um, in this context at this moment is going to reinforce in my child that this is a danger they must be aware of. Yeah. From Atherson, I sorry, I'm, I'll just pause you for, for a second sure. there. One of our other um, people that we were taking evidence from said something that um, resonated with me. It's, it's often the um, hot pan or the danger or the running onto the road that's, that's used as, a, as an explanation um, for loving smacks. It seems peculiar that if a child was running to a car, you're... you're instinct would be to hit them, surely that would knock them over. Wouldn't your instinct be to hold them if it was about keeping them safe? I, I just would be I think, no, I, th I think, you. yes, yeah, no, I, I can see, the, I can see the, the point you're making. I, th I think in that instance, it's, it's more the, to reinforce the fact that the child has run off under these circumstances. Schmidt. And so it's correct, I think it's, it's reinforcement, not necessarily punitive, but to reinforce a sense of alarm in the child. A sense right. of alarm that you understand as a parent, uh -huh. but which they because of their limited sense. So about communicating your alarm at the situation I to the so. child yeah. through pain. I think... Or light pain. Through, I think, yeah. Love I mean, pain. I think through light pain. I think okay. through, through a light slap on the, on the wrist in that circumstance is to say, this is a very dangerous situation okay. you find yourself in. You should... And, and I think the, 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 the purpose of that would be to remind in the future that these are dangerous situations to find yourself mm -hmm. in, that they have consequences. And children will okay. remember that. Okay. I don't think I the consequences... You know. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary Fee, would you just come Thank you, um, convener, and um, can I uh, too welcome um, the, the panel. One of the things that we've heard in um, mostly all of our other evidence sessions um, is the lack of definition on the bill of what reasonable is, because the bill removes the defence of reasonable chastisement. Um, and, and one of the things we've heard is it would be helpful if there was a definition, if the, the bill explained in, um, in plain terms exactly what we meant and what classified reasonable chastisement. Is that something you would agree with? Sorry, uh, just to clarify, are you referring to uh, Mr Finney's legislation or the Criminal Justice Scotland Act? Mr Finney's legislation. So uh, there should be something in the legislation to determine something that yes. is reasonable chastisement? Yes, yes. Um, well, we would say that the definitions under the, uh, under the current Act are good. Um, so they've been mentioned already, uh, and the guidance, the explanatory notes to Section 51 yeah. particularly, um, which talk about moderate, mild, not inspired by vindictiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, these are all helpful terms. But uh, do you, which can do you think used. it needs more of an explanation than moderate, mild? I, I think parents and prosecutors understand that already. Uh, I think the evidence shows that. Um, so that, I'd say that's, uh, that's probably fine as, as it is. Okay. Okay. I, w I would just say previous generations have obviously understood uh, what it meant. Mm. Um, I, I, I just find it strange now that uh, the members of the Scottish Parliament think that uh, modern generations are unfit uh, to know what reasonable chastisement means and they must uh, have a blanket ban. <coughs> okay. um, sure. I think, I think the 2003 changes were very welcome. And and were, mm. were should have, and have been well received. I think mm -hmm. the the um, yeah, I remember my, my my own experience growing up was to get a thick ear for doing things, and um, that possibly couldn't 
impossibly could not happen now. So I'm, I'm really glad of that. Um, but it's, it's good. I think, though, at the, at the same time, um, I, I'm, I'm try, I'm, what I've been trying to work out is balancing the, the harm in this as well. Um, you know, so many of the submissions that the committee have received so far have balanced, um, you know, the, or, or have, have, have sought to assess simply the harm to the child and their experience of pain. Um, but I, my experience as a minister um, and working in pastoral environments and speaking to a number of my colleagues, um, both within my own denomination and more widely within the Evangelical Alliance, is, is seeing that the, the lasting harm that criminal conviction has on um, parents and on families in different situations. And I'm, I'm still, I come back to this. I mean, I've, I've heard the committee repeatedly in, in previous evidence sessions um, articulate the point that there, there is no dramatic, in, there's no envisaged dramatic increase in the number of convictions. But at the end of the day, we're still talking about changing a defence of criminal law. And so inevitably there will be some. There will be some changes. And in my experience, these situations devastate family life. They have a, a, a remarkable impact on the experience of families. And I, I do wonder about where the, where the balance of harm is going to be, where mild chastisement, um, which has been exercised in a loving context, results, unfortunately, perhaps without any deliberate desire on, the, on, 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 our, on, our, on our legislators' part, but nonetheless does result in criminal convictions. How much is the harm in these situations and the impact of that on families being assessed and taken into consideration? I think as a society, these are big questions for us to look at and assess. Okay. I wonder um, if I could ask you then, um, do you think there is any way that this bill could positively, positively change um, the, the way that, that, that parents discipline their, their children? Or do you think it will, be, uh, it will have a negative impact on, on the way parents discipline their children? I don't know, Mr. Gillis, would you like to start, or Reverend Ross? On you go. I think it'll have a, a negative impact uh, on uh, parents. Uh, like my colleague, Mr. McInnes, uh, in the public questions, and uh, wasn't answered, of course. Um, it is going to raise uh, greater tension within the family, especially when um, the this... Uh, Smacking is out. If it is, if it does come in, it's it's outlawed. Um, we know the family life nowadays is, is is quite stressful anyway, and it's going to increase. And I think it's also, um, like we said in our submission, it is going to disrupt and potentially harm families. Uh, and uh, as my colleague here, uh, Gordon Matheson, has mentioned, um, it it'll have a long term effect. Long term effect. Um, to to grow up with that knowledge that your mother or your father has a criminal record uh, would would not only bring damage to the family but to the, the children uh, themselves. So I think it's only going to have a negative effect. And I think the committee really have to think about this. It's going to have a huge negative effect. If this becomes law, it's going to have a huge negative effect uh, on families in Scotland and uh, families are uh, under a lot of pressure as it is and uh, no, I would say it's going to have a very negative. Mr Gallus, Reverend Matheson, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Um, I think I'd just reiterate the, the breadth of, of public opposition uh, to this and the fact that 75% of, of people polled regularly state that they, they don't want to see this change in the law and uh, recent polling said 68% of, of parents sometimes think it's, it's necessary to use a light smack uh, with, a, with a naughty child. Um, so smacking is something that, that's very common, uh, which many, which majority of parents find to be uh, acceptable and reasonable uh, and will continue to use. Um, and uh, these people are the people that are going to be prosecuted and, and arrested and convicted potentially under this law change. Um, so we think it's, it's not really the place of, of Parliament to get into the minutiae of, of family life in this way. Um, and if Parliament feels that smacking is something that's not desirable, then um, you could have an educational campaign or something or, or encourage parents not to smack. But that's very different to changing the criminal law in a way which will 
result in, in real loving parents yeah. being criminalised. Okay. Uh, so we just urge you not to, to carry out the change to the criminal law in this way. Okay. Mr Matheson, is there anything you wanted to briefly add? Perhaps just briefly, uh, one, of, one of the concerns we have where this, um, this change in law may well be most identified in the, in, in the long run. Um, the, the likelihood is that these, you know, if, if, if there were to be any increase in convictions in this, um, that the bill would, it would have a disproportionate impact on vulnerable families in areas of deprivation. I mean, the convictions are going to arise in areas where the police are already present, where social services are already present, and where, you know, not middle class areas where families have it together and the kids are off to school every day and everything seems fine, but in community, in parts of our areas of our, of our communities um, where because of other factors of deprivation, um, there's already intervention happening on a frequent basis. And that, I think, increases the, the scope of criminality in that environment. And I do wonder if that's something that we want to lump on areas of deprivation in our society today. I think a more nuanced approach, um, you know, I always come back to, you know, thinking about this, come back to thinking about how the Bible articulates this in the first place. The, the Bible, if anything, is a story of a family. Uh, in the beginning, the first page, if you ever open a Bible and you read the first chapter, it's a story of God creating a family. And throughout that um, story of the whole of Scripture, um, th there's really the unfolding of God's purposes in families being worked out. And I think, you know, as far as possible as a society, these are the things that we want to reinforce. I think these are positive, good things that churches and many others aside, besides us uh, recognize as good and healthy and helpful. And I, I fear the unintended consequences uh, of this approach um, will be to be disruptive to these things rather than beneficial to them going forward. I wanted to ask you about, um, about faith because I would be keen to, to hear your views on, on where this bill sits within the, the teachings of your church or, or your belief. And, and Reverend Ross, you spoke about um, the authority of God and the moral law and, and, and God's standards, but, but where would this bill sit within the teachings of, of each of your um, faiths? I think I would uh, totally oppose what the, the scriptures teach. I mean, there are, there are many scriptures. Um, mm. I could give you many scriptures that uh, support uh, parents and uh, the parental right to discipline their children. And also, of course, there are many scriptures too that uh, support uh, the, the child's responsibility to give honour to, the, to their parents. So I think this bill, it's going to remove that. It's going to remove that. And it is really, I mean, we, in our submission, uh, we made it clear that uh, it potentially is going to set uh, those who hold to the scriptures uh, to be in a position whether they obey man or whether they obey God. So it's not only going to criminalize uh, parents or, or catch parents. It might, it might have uh, greater ramifications for those who hold to the scriptural uh, Christian faith. I think for, for us with, with, within Evangelical Alliance, um, we, you know, we have a very, um, uh, you know, very clearly articulated platform of Christian teaching built around um, notions of love, freedom, justice, and truth. And, and I think that's reflected generally across the, the teaching and preaching articulated in our, in our member organizations and in their pulpits. Um, and I think how that impacts on family life um, will, will be in a range of ways. Um, I've, have I ever, from the from the pulpit myself, ever 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 gone near this subject yet? No, I haven't. Um, it's 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 not it's not been an area that I've I've yet been able to come up in, in, into contact with in in, in working through uh, through preaching and scripture myself. But and in terms of the specifics of what this bill would address. Um, but I do think, you know, we, we want to articulate reasonable, responsible parenting. Um, we want to articulate and teach um, people in our churches to take seriously um, and proportionately their responsibilities as parents. And, and I think that includes each parent for themselves, um, working out what an appropriate um, level in, 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 their, in their own experience of smacking might be. Um, I mean, my own feeling is that I think a lot of the, the problems perhaps identified in the, in the Strathclyde Police's um, violence reduction unit is where, where, where violent smacking is actually being done.
where, where, the, where the, the, the use of smacking in a home environment goes beyond the very early years of a child's experience, where they've passed the level of being able to cognitively process things for themselves. And at that point, I think you're into a very dangerous territory of, um, of intervention, where, where smacking can have, and probably does have, very negative influences and impacts. But with early years interventions with children, um, I think for parents, that's, that's been, I mean, I'm only speaking from personal experience there, mm. and, and I, I, I feel that's where I have to limit it. Uh, Mr. Gillis, just, just before I, I come to you, I mean, if, if we accept that the scriptures say that parents have the, the right to discipline children, do the scriptures say that parents have the right to hit their children? They explicitly say they have the right to hit their child. If by hit you mean violence, no. Uh, we didn't say smacking is not violence. So, you know, the Institute uh, represents many different Christian denominations. Uh, and we, just, like uh, Reverend Matheson, say that Christian parents use a range of techniques with their children and um, to, discipline their child. to discipline their child. And smacking is one of them. So it's a concern to many of our supporters. Not all our supporters would choose to smack. Um, but many would, uh, and that's just one of the techniques they use. So this, this bill would affect those people. But, but if we want to stick to the letter of what the scriptures say, the scriptures say parents have the ability to discipline their child. Yes. The scripture does not say parents have the right to hit their child. No, uh, no. no. The scripture no. Would, would never condone violence against children. Uh, you look to the, our Heavenly Father, God, as the example of, of parenting, and you know, as Christians we have... Uh, we should discipline our children, that's clear from scripture, but not uh, by violence, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, um, Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. It's just a point of clarification from the Evangelical Alliance, um, if I may. Um, James Gillis talked about um, more resources going into an education campaign, and I take that absolutely on board. Um, the point um, made... Sorry just uh, instead of, of this legislation? No, not, absolutely. Not as, as no, well no, I, as, yeah. I, no, I absolutely take that on board. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and as the, the Evangelical Alliance has stated as well, and I'll, I'll just quote, um, although you do, sorry, that's not the quote, although you do believe from your evidence so far that reasonable and proportionate use of smack and light should be used in a loving parental home. Um, but the, the, the evidence that you wrote, says, we believe investment in education would be a more proportionate way to tackle this issue as compared to potential criminalisation. Could you just clarify for the record what you mean by this issue? What, what is the issue that parents need educated on? I think I have to confess I wasn't involved in actually drafting the, the okay. written submission. Um, this, this is part of my apology for Kieran not being okay. here today. I think Kieran would be able to give you more clarity on that, and if you want, I can ask Claire to, to pass that on to the committee. That might submission. be helpful if you could if you yeah. could write in with an answer to um, that. And I just have um, one one more question. Um, I probably shouldn't use the term devil's advocate, but just to play it for a moment, um, should this bill pass? If it passes, we were gonna we, we will have to have as a as a parliament and a government um, a big awareness raising campaign. How would your organisations raise awareness amongst your supporters and your congregation of new legislation or the removal of the, the justification of assault from legislation? I think carefully. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think there would be a knee-jerk reaction, from, from certainly from the organisations I'm involved with. Um, that's not just Evangelical Alliance, but also the Free Church of Scotland. Um, I think we would have a careful and nuanced response, okay. and that would be the case. Thank you. Yep. Else we yeah. uh, you go I, ahead, I, I, would, I would just say that um, we would uh, remind parents uh, of their responsibility to God first. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, the Christian Institute would obviously communicate uh, the effect of the law, which would be that uh, smacking is now a criminal offence. Okay, well... That draws our first panel session to a close. Thank you very much for your time and your evidence. We will suspend briefly while we swap the panels over.
Okay, welcome back everyone to our um, second panel session. Can I welcome Peter Nimmo, Minister of Old High St Stephen's Church of Scotland, Inverness, and representative of the Church and Society Council, Church of Scotland. You're very welcome. Mary Campbell-Jack, Scottish Parliamentary Engagement Officer for Quakers in Britain. Hello. And Fraser Sutherland, Campaigns and Communication Manager for the Humanist Society of Scotland. You're all very welcome this afternoon. Um, can I begin by asking if you support the aims of the Bill, which are to end the physical punishment of children? Fraser. Yes, the Humanist Society of Scotland support this bill. Um, we believe very strongly in human rights and we believe that the United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which states all human beings are born free and equal, applies equally to children as it does to adults and that the protections under um, that declaration should apply equally to children as it does adults. Thank you. Peter. Thank you. Yes, uh, the Church of Scotland does support the aims of this bill. Thank you. Quakers in Scotland support this bill. Okay. Thank you. Alec Cole Hamilton, to open should, up. Thank you, Convener. I, should, I suppose I should declare for the record that I am a Quaker myself. Um, thank you very much for coming to see us today. Look forward to your evidence. Can we start where we started with the last panel, which is about this uh, perceived conflict between parents' rights and children's rights. And we know um, where children's rights exist in international law um, to be free from any form of physical uh, punishment. Um, is there a, a real tension there? Um, and where would we find a, a commensurate right in international law for parents to physically punish their children? Quakers would say that seeing it as a children versus parents issue isn't actually helpful. Um, it's very much a lose-lose situation. And we do a lot of conflict resolution. We've been working in a lot of areas um, internationally as well as domestically in communities where we try to help people resolve conflicts. And generally we try to look for a win-win situation. I think rather than looking at it as parents' rights and children's rights, it might be better to include them all in one group called human rights. And all humans deserve to be free from violence. Um, I do get that there is a tension and I can see why people are, are worried about that and I think it's very reasonable for people to have questions about that. So we would hope that as this bill pro progresses and the scrutiny of it goes forward, some of those questions would be answered by people but also if the bill does pass that the Scottish Government would be able to do some education, some awareness raising and help people understand those issues um, a bit better. I think, yes, I agree that, in a sense, it looks like there's a tension here. Uh, and yet, uh, we as a society have long accepted uh, that um, a parent's rights over their children does not exclude the involvement of the rest of the community. And indeed, maybe in some ways, I'm, the way I'm listening to this, I'm wondering if we're framing this in a slightly kind of Western way of thinking about the, the nuclear family. Um, because um, we all of us have a responsibility to bring up children in a, in a, a loving and caring environment. Uh, and therefore, it's absolutely accepted that where things are going badly wrong in a family, that the state and other actors uh, have a, a place uh, to protect the most vulnerable in society, and children are among the most vulnerable in society. I don't see any um, evidence that you're saying, uh, Alex, of kind of differences in international law and that this being some kind of uh, battle between parents and, and, and children. I mean, parents are guild guardians of their children's rights. They're not arbitrators on what rights those children should actually enjoy. Children can actually be some of the most vulnerable people in society, and it's right that the state has a, a role in protecting those children. They have a role in protecting people with disabilities and dementia, for example. Should we hit those people as well to help them learn lessons? I don't think that's an acceptable approach, and I don't think it's acceptable in public life. So I don't think it's acceptable that children uh, should be hit in that way either. There's a, a wee bit of confusion, I think, with the, some of the evidence that's been written to the committee about the interference with Article 8 on family life. The EHRC has no clear right to use violence in relation to family life. That's not something that's set out within the framework. It's a bit of a red herring that's being deployed. And the UNCRC actually states that parents have quite a clear role to protect children from violence and, and not actually inflict it upon them. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, obviously, you were, I think you were present for the, the previous panel. We had a very interesting discussion about um, 
where this fits in the discussion of faith. And I'd like to ask the panel, um, in reflecting on the comments of the previous witnesses, um, wh where do we, um, from where do we base our sort of human moral laws or human uh, domestic laws? And, and where is that link with faith and scripture and how closely should they mirror each other? Well, Quakers are slightly unusual compared to some of the other churches. Um, we don't actually believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God that can never be wrong. We would consider ourselves to be an orthopraxy rather than an orthodoxy. And that means that we don't have a central document from which we take our rules to live our life. Um, that's not to say the Bible isn't helpful. It's more that we would see that as, um, say, the, the writings of ancient people who are trying their best to interpret the world, interpret God, interpret what they understand of God, given the knowledge that they have. Um, as Quakers have an orthopraxy, that does give us some flexibility because it means as we learn more about the world through science, through understanding, we can kind of um, absorb that into the way we choose to live our lives. And we would absorb what we have learned through child psychology, through science, through the studies that have been done. And we would use that and think about it and think about what that means for the practice of, of living our lives rather than say have one document which told us how to behave forever which isn't to mean that we don't respect other churches beliefs in the bible and that we don't respect their faith we very much do it's just we choose to see things slightly differently reverend nimmo before i bring you in can i ask i mean obviously um you're representing the church of sure. scotland mm -hmm. um do you is have there been times in the past where you think that the bible has led to uh a basket of laws that we adopt as a society which we have subsequently set aside because they no longer suit our time and life okay it depends what you mean by that does the bible define a, a a set of laws my understanding would be that um very much at the background of our own cultural experience has been you know two thousand years of interpreting the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. And so to that extent, there is a, a, a sort of Judeo-Christian undergirding of our society. But um, as a church, we would, I think, always have said that um, it's very difficult to say that you have an infallible uh, understanding of these ancient texts and that therefore, while living within the spirit of um, what we believe to be the, the word of God is revealed in, in scripture, uh, nevertheless, there would be instances where um, throughout history, people have, have made mistakes in those interpretations. Does that make sense? Yes, that, that's very helpful. And finally, Fraser, obviously as a humanist, um, you have your own views about um, the scriptures, but um, can, can you speak to those? Yeah, I think for us, you know, one thing that humanists share a view on is that no one faith or belief group should have ultimate authority over laws of a land. In fact, in countries around the world where laws are dictated solely on the basis of religious interpretation can be really, really strict. So in countries where humanists stand up for minority faith groups against blasphemy laws, for example, using a, a religious text as a, a core tenant to shape all your, your human laws, I don't I think to be a, a good idea. Indeed, actually, a secular approach which divorces religion and belief from the, the lawmaking process allows for a society where everyone, no matter what their religion and belief, can, can approach life fair and equal. And I think it's important just at this stage to say what I mean by secularism, because sometimes there's a bit of deliberate myth-making about what secularism is. People talk about secularism as if it's removing the right for people to practice their religion. That's not what it's about. There's three main factors to secularism. It's about separating out religious institutions from the state and that there's no domination in the political sphere for one particular religious institution. It's about defending people's freedom of thought, religious and conscience. And I'm a great defender of that. I'm, I'm really passionate about defending people's rights to believe in whatever religion or faith they want to follow and that they should be able to change their decisions about that as their life goes on, as 
know, maybe myself, I would say that I changed my point of view on this in the past. And other people, you know, come to us and leave us and go and join churches. I think that's really important in an open and free society. And the third point when it comes to secularism is there's <coughs> no discrimination. So there should be no discrimination on individuals based on their faith or beliefs. So they shouldn't be denied access for a service because they're Muslim or Jewish, or they shouldn't be, uh, you know, dismissed from a job because they are, their religion somehow doesn't fit with what the, the employer thinks of, about them. So it has to be those three things together in order to have an open and free society and a, a secular view. And, and religious groups should have a voice. They should have a voice in Parliament. They should bring towards their views, but that shouldn't be a dominant way in which we uh, inform our laws. Thank you. OK. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, um, and welcome to um, our second panel. Um, can I ask the panel if they think that this bill has the ability to change the way that parents will discipline their children? Well, it's really hard to predict the future, obviously, but um, when we look at other countries that have enacted similar bills, there have been changes in how people have parented their children. Um, I think in France there was a drop in the amount of smacking and also a drop in the amount of abuse as well. So it seems like it is quite a strong signal to people. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think... Um, when we have looked at this, we, uh, and you've uh, been looking at, at the evidence um, that there appears to be evidence to suggest uh, that um, this has that this kind of legal change has had uh, positive consequences for children and for society in general. And if we are interested in ensuring the, the well-being of children, then we have to take that kind of evidence very seriously. Okay, um, I think it helps in, in terms of challenging, you know, things that can lead to violence, breeding more violence, for example. And I know that um, evidence has already spoke about, about the violence reduction units, evidence that's been given to the committee and in, in, in challenging views of violence in society. And we all know the success that they've had in challenging knife crime in Glasgow, for example, over the past uh, decade or so. Um, and you've heard in previous sessions, I think, quite overwhelming academic uh, published research that shows quite a clear association between harsh physical punishment in the home and negative and behavioural outcomes. And I would just uh, really encourage the committee to, to look seriously at academic research we've been plug published in this area. I think the claim quite often is made that, you know, I, and we heard it in the last panel, I got smacked and I'm not violent. It's a bit of a straw man because, you know, some people smoke their entire lives, but they don't get lung cancer. But that doesn't mean that we dismiss the evidence that shows there is quite and increase risks between people who smoke and lung cancer. So just dismissing something because one person uh, ha has done it and it doesn't give them uh, the negative outcomes doesn't mean that that doesn't apply to everyone and everyone or anyone that's, that applies to. OK, thanks for that. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you was the, um, the, whether or not we need a further explanation, if, if the bill needs a bit more clarity around the removal of the, the defence of... Um, reasonable chastisement. Um, and we have heard that the, the, the key aim of this is to, to remove a defence, and we have to be, be very clear that what we're, we're, we're not doing is, is criminalising people who perhaps give a light smack in the hand to protect a child. It's the intent to cause harm. And if a smack is given with the intent to cause harm, that's when we have to um, to look at it in, in, in the scope of, of this bill. So does the bill need more clarity and more of an explanation around what is reasonable and what we are actually removing? I think it does. I think reasonable is actually a really tricky word. Everybody thinks they're reasonable, but not everybody is reasonable to everybody else. Um, we can no longer say that the opinion of the man on the Clapham omnibus is everybody's opinion. Mm. And if we also look at families, there's so many different types of family out there. Um, we might have families who are from different cultures where they have a completely different idea of what reasonable is when it comes to child chastisement. We might have families who are dealing with children who have a lot of problem behaviours for different reasons and might need to take a slightly different tack from, say, the quite well-off middle-class family down the road who only have a couple of kids who are very well behaved. I think 
a one size fits all doesn't fit modern family life because we no longer have one type of family anymore. And I know when speaking with Quakers, they were very concerned that parents who are really struggling sometimes with very difficult circumstances might end up being overstigmatized over this. But do you think there is a risk that this, the, the circumstance that, that you described, if, if an investigation is carried out into a child who has been smacked, that the circumstances you speak out, that, that very difficult um, child, very difficult family, very difficult circumstances, do you think there's a danger that won't be taken into account? Well, I have to admit, I'm not an expert in how people investigate these kinds of cases, so I wouldn't want to make too much of a blanket statement about it. I, I would hope that if this law came into place, then our police officers and our social workers would have full training. I would hope we'd be employing people in these roles who had good judgment and who were able to take in considering all these different things and would make good judgments. To a certain extent, no law is perfect and we have to trust the people in our society who are the gatekeepers of our law to do a good job. Um, I think we need to make sure when we're talking about this law that we're also giving them the resources, the training, the education to be able to do, make these decisions as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with much of what Mary has just said, or all of it really. Um, but I think I would also say um, that part of putting this proposed law into action would require uh, resourcing parents and, and families and helping the rest of us in a wider community understand what this means and how there are alternatives, types of discipline and punishment which, which, can, or, or, which can be given to children. Um, so, 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 so that is not quite the answer, not quite answering what you said, but it seems to me that that is part of the, the kind of broader context of us all uh, coming to a, a you know a deeper understanding of, of, of what's required of us all here. So, awareness raising over here around this legislation. Uh, that I think we have said in our submission that that is absolutely key, so that parents understand what their uh, how their responsibilities in some ways have changed, but also how we can strengthen family life and, and enable mm. uh, parents to uh, ensure that children are still being brought up in a, a structured way, a disciplined way, if you want to call it that, because that's important, that helps children to flourish, um, but that they do so uh, without now recourse to uh, physical punishments. Okay. Fraser, is there anything you want to add? I don't have much to add uh, 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 on what's already been said, to be honest. I think, actually, this helps to potentially remove some confusion about what is reasonable um, by removing the, the defence. The t 2003 changes clearly were very welcome in, in so far as they went, um, but it, it does actually open up a bit of confusion about well, what is reasonable, what's not reasonable, and if you want to know, well, you're going to have to become an, a, a legal expert and look at all the case law to decide for yourself what's a reasonable chastisement. So actually, by removing that as a defence, then you're sending actually quite a clear message. Um, and I would say then you don't have to define that so much as explain it and bring awareness to the public as a whole. OK, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. OK, Dr McGregor. Yeah, thanks for coming on and welcome uh, to the panel. Um, in the last um, evidence session there, we heard from the Christian, Christian Institute, um, who also wrote into us, and they've um, raised concerns that the removal of the justifiable assault could actually um, lead to an increase um, in um, anxiety and, and other issues um, for for children, is that, is that something that you've came across in, in your own thoughts and research? Well, before I did the, the submission that Quakers in Scotland put in on this bill, I actually asked young Quakers in Scotland if they wanted me to work on it. And the answer was a very resounding yes. They made it absolutely clear they wanted this to happen. I can't speak for all young people. That's not what I'm here to do. But I can speak for the young Quakers in Scotland who very strongly feel that this is a law they want to see passed, that they think it will make children less anxious. And also it might help them know what's wrong and what isn't and when they can go for help as well, which can sometimes also be confusing for children too. And, and taking into account the, and from the last evidence session, the, um, the example that was given about Sweden, because I think that most of the other examples that we've had 
there's been some evidence, uh, although the evidence is hard to work out, there's been some evidence that uh, it's led to, um, it's, it's, it's had a positive impact overall, like in France that you mentioned there, but I think Sweden was mentioned in the last thing. So I'm not, again, an, an expert on any of this research, but it seems to me that in this kind of discussion, what we should keep in front of us is that we want children to flourish, we want children to develop into responsible adults, um, and therefore it's incumbent on all of us to find the best ways to do that. Now, if there's a body of evidence that says that um, not uh, assaulting children as part of our disciplining and bringing children up is something that leads to positive results for children and for society in general, then clearly we should be taking that into account. But I'm I'm tempted to say that it's for legislators (laughs) to be uh, looking at um, evidence like that and weighing it and and deciding what to do with it. On On the issue of Sweden, I think... On the issue of Sweden, I think I would probably want to see a bit more about that research before I came to any conclusion, because correlation isn't necessarily causality. Violence, from our experience, is often due to a number of different factors, which can be personal, interpersonal, societal, and even worldwide. So it's very difficult sometimes to pick apart what has led to one act of violence. And I think it would need some good and deep research to work out what exactly is going on in Sweden. Okay. So so the other area I was going to um, ask about as well, which which probably takes us on nicely from that, is... Um, the possible, the concern that we've heard um, on committee about the possible over-criminalisation of um, parents um, who who are loving parents and, and just trying to do the best for their children, and, and this concern that there could be a whole, um, you know, a, a whole load of, 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 of prosecutions. The vast majority of the evidence we've heard from agencies um, has been that that's unlikely to be the case. And uh, um, th- there's already systems in place through the child protection process and prosecution. Have you got any thoughts on that? And perhaps I could start with yourself, Fraser. Don't have anything more than I think what you've said that you've you've had e- experts give you evidence on this, of where it's been trialled elsewhere, and, and the results of of what actual lived experiences. Um, I would just say you can't really rely on pontification that somehow just because someone thinks something's going to lead to someone, when actually the evidence shows you completely <coughs> the opposite, that you should just listen to the the pontification. Um, it's a straw man argument that this is going to criminalise parents. The bill is quite clear. You're not introducing a new criminal offence. You're removing a, 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 a defence. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for that, um, that, that answer. And I suppose just for the other two panellists, when you answer as well, are you, simply are you concerned that this will criminalise parents unnecessarily? I, again, I... I um, not an expert on the evidence, but I, I don't think the evidence is pointing in that way. Um, it looks as if um, the, the more kind of basic issue is that um, what we have done in terms of, of rights, in a, in a sense, or where we are, is that children appear to have fewer rights than adults do if we're allowing this defence of reasonable chastisement. It means that children in our society are the only group in our society who uh, we can defend using violence against, certainly in the home. We don't do it with criminals. I'm old enough to remember when it was done to school children, we don't do it to school children any longer. So it seems seems quite wrong and and, and very strange that we we still allow that defence within a family where, where a child is having an act of violence against them. I think it's understandable that parents would be concerned about this and this would be something at the forefront of their minds when they're considering this bill. Um, And I think that's one of the reasons why it would be good to have awareness raising and education and, as Peter said as well, work with communities and, and with parents to help them understand what's happening. We don't particularly believe we will see a huge rise in the criminalization of parents and I think, again, it comes back to the fact that we have to have a certain amount of trust in our social workers, in our police officers, that they are doing a good job. And, and staying on that, the, the last um, panel there we did 
Um, well, I, can't, I can't remember which panelist brought it up now, but I, I took a note at the time. I can remember, but one of the, the issues that was raised um, was that the, perhaps um, this law would impact uh, mainly or, or, or mostly um, on more disadvantaged families, and that is that is clearly something that the committee would not want to be the case. Can you, have you got any um, thoughts on, or have you got any th fears or concerns that that would, that would be the case, that if there is to be any increase in criminalisation of prosecutions, that it's most likely going to be weighted on families who are already struggling, and how could perhaps that come about? Um, I have to admit, I hadn't actually considered that before the panellist mentioned it, but as soon as he did, I thought, that's a really good point. Um, because sometimes, quite often, laws and things that change in society hit the poorest, the hardest and the worst. And that isn't to mean they're the only people who are smacking their children. There are plenty of middle class families and upper class families who are doing it too. But we have an uh, unequal society and so these things do impact on people unequally. Um, I think I believe part of the scrutiny of bills is to look at this and to look at how it affects people. And I would suggest that this should be something that would be worth the committee looking into. Um, we'd also suggest looking at families who come to Scotland from different cultures who might also find that they're, they're being pros um, brought to attention more for these reasons, and also possibly families who um, are indigenous but are maybe dealing with difficult circumstances, such as children with very difficult behaviours, might also need extra help as well. Nothing really more to add on that. Okay, well, thanks, Camille. Sure. Do you want to come back? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Fraser Sutherland, um, you made a very interesting point at the start of your remarks about the fact that um, it, we, we don't allow the physical punishment of adults with learning disabilities or dementia who might have a mental age of, uh, well, of childhood. Um, in that context, um, we've heard a lot about restraint or, or the use of physical punishment to warn people, to warn children about the dangers of hot pans, running out into traffic. Mm. Do you think that we should liberalise um, laws around assault so that we can physically punish adults with dementia or uh, adults with learning disabilities who might put themselves in the same danger? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think, again, we have to follow the evidence when it comes to children. In these 54 other countries where this law has been changed, has there all of a sudden been a massive increase in scalds or children running out and being run over by, by cars? And there's no evidence that that's the case. Yeah. So it, it, you need to lead policy on evidence, not on what about it. Um, this bill doesn't you know, class stopping danger as assault. I mean, if I saw an adult walking along the street and they were playing a game on their phone or texting someone and walking out, would my, my initial reaction wouldn't be to hit them. It would be to pull them back from the road. And I'm not assaulting them doing that. Mm -hmm. So why is that not the same for a child? And when once you've saved that child from danger, can you not have a restorative conversation with that child, making them aware of what the danger is without using physical violence? I, I would argue very much that you can have that conversation. Teachers across Scotland every single day mm -hmm. have very good restorative conversations with pupils. They do not hit them anymore. We do not let parent, uh, teachers hit children anymore. Um, and that was a fantastic change in law. And I have to say that was a change in law that had to come about because a parent had to go all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. The, you know, there's this argument, we heard it in the first panel, that it's a political elite that don't listen to the public. You know, in 1983, when, when, when Grace Campbell took that legal case, the political elite weren't listening to her. They weren't listening to actually... The, the thoughts of children, the thoughts of parents. Um, she actually had to take the legal case herself all the way to Strasbourg to actually enforce human rights. And maybe one of the reasons why they didn't, uh, the, the politicians at the time didn't change the law around uh, uh, physical punishment in schools was because opinion polls told them not to. And that's another argument that's often used, but the public don't want this change, so we said we shouldn't do it. And again, in 1983, the public didn't support removing the belt from schools, but actually the courts forced them to do so because it was a fundamental breach of the human rights. And, and just on that, if I may, I think that's a really interesting point. We touched it on um, in the last panel. Um, should Parliament always follow public opinion, or should it seek to try and lead it and change it? I don't think it, I mean, if you want to just follow public opinion, then we may as well just dissolve Parliament and have referendums every day. 
Would either of you like to come no, in? I would of? absolutely. That our, our parliament is a deliberative assembly. We ask, we elect you to go and do exactly what you're doing just now, examine the evidence, um, hear from various points of view, uh, and, um, and at times parliament will lead. Sometimes parliament, though, is, is, is behind, and um, we want to be in a, a democracy to, to hear the voices of, of those who are maybe saying what is radical one day might eventually become something that the rest of us catch up with. So. Um, I'd agree with my fellow panellists. I think a really good example is the smoking ban. Um, I was actually working on social research of the smoking ban at the time and people were saying all kind of things like we're going to have Nazis coming into the country next and this is against my human rights. And the day that law came into effect, nothing happened. Everybody just just obeyed that law and and we adapt very quickly um i would say with that law there was a lot of education about it and people did really know about it um so there there is a job i think if you're leading to lead in a way that is kind and to lead in a way that is compassionate but i don't think we can always go with public opinion but i think it is really important to make sure everyone's listened to yes, thank you Gil Ross. thank you um <coughs> Hello, panel. Thank you for your evidence so far. I wanted to, um, first of all, we've we've had some evidence um, and we also heard from the first panel um, that legislation is not necessary and that we should just go with an education and awareness raising campaign. What's your thoughts on that? Um, personally, we'd probably go for both and say that we do think legislation sends an incredibly strong message. There was some research done in Glasgow, and I think about 66% of parents said that if this law was brought in, they would smack less. And I think that shows it does send a message to people that Scotland's now considering that this isn't acceptable anymore. But I think it does have to go hand in hand with education and awareness. Yes, I think I would agree with that and, and, and maybe even strengthen it by, by just saying that I, I think it would be a signal that we find uh, violence increasingly unacceptable. We are struggling with violence and have done uh, in, our, uh, in our communities um, and yet we've begun to see ways, we've mentioned the violence reduction in, in Glasgow which is uh, something which is, is very exciting and interesting um, and so we should uh, if, if we can a change in the law like this I think would just reinforce the thought that um, you, you know on the whole violence is not a solution to anything and as Christian people, we would certainly want to um, I, I, I agree with that, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a huge amount more to add than what I said before in answer to Mary's question about, you know, the change in the law actually, if anything, makes it much clearer about what the boundaries are at the moment with the 2003 Act. Perhaps there's a bit of confusion about what's reasonable. I think it sends a very strong message, although I can't disagree at all with the other members of the panel who have spoken that it does need education if you bring in um, any new legislation. I mean, the smoking ban's been talked about and clearly at the time there was a lot of awareness raising about what, when that was coming in, the date that was coming in and what that meant in terms of uh, pubs and clubs around the country. So clearly you know, any legal change would need to be backed up by some kind of education. Um, and just to dig into that a little bit further, what, what would you see the education and awareness raising campaign, what, what do you think that should look like? Um, I think it would probably need to speak to several different audiences. So I would like to see an awareness raising campaign with children and aimed at children. But I think it's also absolutely essential that we aim one at parents and grandparents as well and aim one at people who are, are caring, who, who might not be relatives too. Um, I think it would be really important to get other organisations who work with children involved in that, people like Children First, um, the Scottish Children's Commissioner, they could probably, um, Young Scott as well, they, it would probably be vital to be including all these people. And could I add to that that from uh, from a faith community's perspective, um, I think they have a role to play, mm -hmm. and, and certainly um, in our report 
to our General Assembly in 2016, uh, where we suggested that this change in the law is something we should support. Um, we, we were clear uh, that our, our church would seek to promote resources that support the development of a non-violent approach uh, to the upbringing of children. Now, whether we produce those resources ourselves or, or whether we, we use resources from other denominations or, or other sources too, I think um, I think we would probably that, that that's the way we would go. We, we don't necessarily have uh, the, um, the the resources to produce our own oh, the resources to produce our own resources. <laughs> but we would be. But one of the things we would want to say is to those parents who are worried that this is in some way, uh, you know, not uh, in parallel with their own faith commitments. That certainly our thought in our denomination, and I think other. Um, faith communities could feel this way too, that you, it would be possible to, to explain why this change and why the promotion of a non-violent approach to parenting is something that resonates with your values as a faith community. We certainly felt that um, it, this change in the law did, and our General Assembly agreed with us. Um, and so, so just that, you know, it's a kind of fine-grained ap approach in a way that, that you could, you're able to say to people with different faith uh, outlooks and different philosophies, look, this is something which is in, in line with your, your own uh, kind of deepest, most deeply held values. I think I'd agree with Mary. I'd want, definitely want to see some kind of uh, education resources or, or, or methods um, aimed towards children and young people in, in, in particular. Um, but I would like to see, you know, particular looking at what's already provided for parents. So particularly young parents, there's a lot of support mechanisms around soon-to-be parents or, uh, you know, people who have just had children. There's already quite a lot of connections with health services and other people. And perhaps if you're trying to get the message out, it's already through those networks that those families are already touching base with. And, and faith communities, for example, are an important part of that because there's a lot of people who will come into contact with them. Um, but certainly I think within um, the NHS and others, there's already going to be a really good connection with health workers that we could, we could use to get the messages out. Gordon, I believe you had a couple of questions. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, just a question to all of the panellists. Um, I think all of you will be aware that the European Court of Human Rights, indeed the UK Supreme Court, has confirmed that um, there is a right to live out one's faith or religion or beliefs um, in a real way, not just hold those beliefs and you know quietly think them, but live them out. And, of course, that includes in the family, in the home, which is particularly protected under the convention. Um, and unlike the smoking ban, of course, which didn't apply to the private home, uh, I think the understanding is that this would. Now, there are different views of in, within religion. So there might be a Christian like Reverend Nimmo who sincerely believes that smacking is not the right thing to do. There might be another Christian like um, the Reverend Ross who takes a different view. And, of course, one of the convention, uh, the court has also indicated it's the right of the individual to live out their religion as they believe it, so not as the majority of that religion or otherwise. So I think all three panelists agree with, from you know the point of view they're coming from or belief point of view, with what they understand the bill is trying to do. My question is, um, where is the protection in the bill for someone like um, the Reverend Ross who holds an equally sincere but different uh, viewpoint, uh, which I think I'm sure Reverend Nimmo will agree that Christians may differ on you know, different issues. Uh, some may be conscientious objectors like Quakers, some may not. So where is the protection, and if it's not there, should it be put in the bill? It's not unusual for uh, the state or for wider society to put limits on the way in which people express their religious beliefs. And if we think as a society that certain practices which may or may which may seem to have a, a sort of deep religious um, basis are nevertheless uh, issues which do not uh, um, promote the well-being of society as a whole, then, of course, um, the, the state has a right 
uh, in those circumstances. And in a democracy, we do that in a democratic way. Yes, we have all we have rights. Um, but if I was to say to you that um, perhaps I had a conscientious issue about the way government was spending my taxes and that I would therefore not pay my taxes, I think the state correctly would have something to say about that, that there, there, there are limits on, on what we do. And that is because as we... Um, kind of try to live out whatever rights we think we have, we may well be impinging on the rights of others. Now, from, from my point of view, we're talking here about children. Children are vulnerable. Children need to be protected. So if um, we have come to a view that uh, violence of any kind against children for whatever reason is just not good for children, then certainly we should legislate in that way. Um, and um, yes, that may impinge on what someone else's rights think they are, but, you know, who, who, are, we, who are we about here? We're, we're talking about the, the right of a child not to uh, suffer something which might be quite traumatic, even if we didn't mean it to be traumatic. Uh, we may think of a you know, a slap in the ear is not very important, but, you know, if the research is showing and the experience is that it's, it's not good for the child and it's not good for society in general, then, yes, there is that conflict or a, a tension, but, you know, again, we as a society have to work our way around those tensions, and we've been doing that for centuries. I, I'd say I agree with what Reverend Nemo is saying there. Um, as we're developing our understanding of rights, there are going to be these tricky questions and, and situations that we're going to have to tease out as a society and, and work out how we deal with them. Um, I think the important point, as Reverend Nimmo said, was we're talking about children, and I think their vulnerability has to be put at the centre of this. And I think you can also, um, just to completely com conflate and exaggerate it, say somebody might sincerely believe their God tells them to kill other people. That doesn't mean we're going to sit there and go, well, your right to your religious sincere belief trumps those people's right to life. I think when we're talking about actual harm that's being done, and there is quite a lot of evidence that this not only harms children, but it also harms parents and it harms their relationship with their children, then that harm has to be the first consideration. Just on, on, on that point, there is, you're quite right to point out, a freedom of thought and religion and belief uh, under European uh, human rights law, but it is actually limited within the acts of public order and the rights of others. So there's actually case law which shows that you are allowed to restrict that right where there is a need to protect other people's rights and where there is a limit to protect public order. And that's coming from case law at the European Court of Human Rights. So if the, uh, the, obviously the Parliament can decide that they see that the, the punishment, physical punishment of children is impacting on the rights of children. And so the defence that my religion tells me that it's OK to do that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Just a quick, um, well, just a quick follow up on that, because part of the right is the right of the child to be raised in accordance with its own parents' religion. So it's not quite as simple as saying it's, you know, um, the, the child has rights, because, of course, one of the rights the child has is to be raised in accordance with the religion of its family and their rights and responsibilities on both sides, of course, parents or children. I don't think anyone would, well, I would hope no one would disagree with that. So if, if it is a, a question of belief, then the, the, the real question is, um, are you saying there should be no protection for those who don't believe uh, or this approach is correct? Is that what you're ultimately saying? And, and that includes the child should have no right to be raised in accordance with its own religious faith or that of its family, perhaps better said. I think I would just reiterate that the general principle that, of course... Everyone, including children, um, has have a right to, to live out a particular religion or philosophy, and that's a, a hard won right and, and something which is uh, very important to religious communities. 
but where you have a, 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 a tension between that happening and even if a child thinks it's good for them, <laughs> you know, uh, and 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 a, and a body of evidence that suggests that um, you know this is more harmful, that the, the, the harm really outweighs the the the, 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 the rights of, of a, a person. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it would be a very significant erosion of a person's religious rights to take away from them the possibility of um, using corporal punishment against their children. But that's maybe a subjective view. Panellists wish to add anything to that? I'd I'd just agree with Reverend Nimmer. Okay. Um, I mean, all I'd say is that, you know, quality human rights legislation protects people from unfair treatment based on their age. And so if we're going down the road that... You know, young people should be allowed to be hit because they're young people, and therefore, because their parents decide that that's con- you know that's within their faith protection, that therefore their other rights are eroded. You know, there's not this kind of hierarchy of rights where I'm, I'm afraid that freedom of religion and belief protects people over the their right to be free from uh, violence, for example. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Finney. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank all the members of our panel for your your time and your evidence. Very helpful in our considerations. Our next meeting will be on the 21st of March, where we'll continue to take evidence on the bill. And can I just thank um, the people on Skype for their hospitality and their help today. We've had a very um, informative and interesting day. And I close this meeting.